Welcome, one and all, to the Cool Worlds podcast with me, your host, David Kipping. This week, it is my pleasure to be joined by one of my wonderful colleagues in the Department of Astronomy at Columbia University, and that is Professor Catherine Johnston. So besides from being a, a colleague in the department, Catherine is also the Dynamics Group Leader at the Flatiron Institute, which is also in New York City. So Catherine and I, we first got to know each other, must have been like seven or eight years ago, when I was first being recruited to become a faculty member at the department. And Catherine was actually the chair of the department at the time, so obviously I had a large number of interactions with Catherine. And I have to say, one of the large reasons why I chose to come to Columbia was because those those interactions were so positive. It really gave me a sense that the department was a collegial, friendly environment, but one that strove to be the best it could be. It understood and valued the rigors of science, open data, transparency in our methodologies and approach to science. Um, but also it was a place that valued teaching, the outcomes of our students, and trying to create a fair and collegial environment for everyone to work in, for everyone to become their best. And so yeah, that was very attractive to me, and I think it really embodies not just the department, but especially Catherine's own approach to science. And since then, you know, we've only got to work together more and more. We've even co-mentored students together. Some of you might remember Moya McTeer, now Dr. Moya McTeer, but she was one of my PhD students. Um, we co-mentored Moya together in terms of the science, but now Moya has gone on to become a superstar in her own right. She's on PBS, she's written books. There's a book called The Milky Way, an autobiography from our galaxy's perspective. You should check that out if you haven't already. Um, and I have to say that, you know, working with Catherine has always been a great pleasure. Today though, I want to sit down with Catherine and talk about her science. And Catherine is renowned as a leader in her field of science, which in particular focuses on the Milky Way galaxy, our own home galaxy. And there's so many things that we really don't understand about our galaxy still today, and they're still learning. So in this in this podcast today, we explore, first of all, we'll go through kind of a basics, you know, what is uh, the structure of our galaxy? What is the bulge? What is the bar? What is the thin disk, the thick disk, the halo? All of these terms that maybe you've heard of, maybe you haven't, we break down all of them for you so you can truly understand what our Milky Way is like. Then we get into kind of really the meat of what Catherine has been trying to work on over the last 10 years, uh, or one of the things she's been working on, which is trying to understand the dark matter distribution in our own galaxy. So we think dark matter is the dominant source of matter in our universe, and our Milky Way is certainly no exception in that case. But trying to test, A, whether do we genuinely believe it is dark matter versus some modified theory of gravity, and B, if we believe it is dark matter, what does it tell us about the nature of this dark matter? Is it clumpy? Where is it located? What's the shape of this stuff in terms of its correspondence to the disk of the Milky Way? Um, and how are we making these measurements in the first place? So we'll get into all of that jazz. And then finally, towards the end of the discussion, we'll talk about Gaia. Gaia is a European mission that was launched about a decade ago, but it's been sort of revolutionizing our knowledge and understanding of the Milky Way too, by measuring billions of stars, literally billions of stars, to characterize their positions, their astrometry very, very precisely, which in turn has led to new insights about the groupings and clusterings and behaviors of clusters of stars, which in turn tells us about the dynamics of the Milky Way itself. So we get into all of that. I think you're gonna like it if you care about where you live in the universe. This is a great podcast for you. So please do join me for this conversation with Catherine Johnston. Catherine, your work focuses on understanding the Milky Way, our yeah. home galaxy. Yeah. yeah. And I think one of the most basic questions, just to get everyone on the same page, is what is the nature and the structure of our own Milky Way? Just a, a 101 to bring us all onto the same page. Okay. So the Milky Way is what's known as a spiral galaxy. Uh, its shape is somewhat like a flying saucer. It has a bulge of stars at the center, and it's surrounded by a disk. I'm going to refer to it as a disk. Um, and the disk has stars moving around it in nearly circular orbits. 
Um, but there's also a huge halo of dark matter that surrounds this disk. Oh, and I should mention, the disk contains spiral arms. You will have seen those beautiful pictures mm -hmm. of spiral galaxies. So they are referred to either as disk galaxies or spiral galaxies. Okay, so the other component I just mentioned, the huge halo of dark matter surrounding the galaxy. So I basically three components, the bulge, the disk of stars, and the halo of dark matter surrounding it. And the disk, is it is it a single disk? And we sometimes, if you ever go to an astronomy talk, you will often hear the phrase thick disk, thin disk being used. Yeah. And similarly, mm -hmm. in the center of the galaxy, you hear these terms of bar and bulges. So yeah. there's these other components. Can you just break down the anatomy a little bit there? Yeah, yeah. So within this disk of stars, there are some stars that only bob up, bob up and down gently as they go around. I said circular orbits, and it makes you think of um, it makes you think of the solar system. And in that case, you've got the uh, planets orbiting almost in a single plane. You're mm -hmm. going to contradict me there, but <laughs> almost in a single plane. In the galaxy, these uh, stars are going around, and uh, the motion is governed by gravity, just the way, same way it is in the solar system. But as they're going around, they're actually also going slightly in, inwards and outwards, um, towards and away from the galactic center, and they're also bobbing up and down. So stars that are in the thin disk of the galaxy, these only bob up and down a little bit as they go around, and stars in the thick disk bob up and down a lot. So we actually think, mm, you have to remember with um, uh, objects like galaxies, they are not solid objects. They are made up of billions of stars that are all orbiting each other. So you can actually have uh, two different geometrical structures contained on top of each other. Um, uh, so that's where the thin disk and thick disk come from. Okay, should we talk about the bar? Yeah, well? let's talk about, I mean, all these, yeah, and, and also the spirals. I think, what is the bar, what is the bulge? And I think another question people often wonder is, what exactly are these spiral components? Yeah. What, what, what's going on there? Yeah, this is the point where you need a visual. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but let's start with the bar. Um, so I, I just very simply said the center of the uh, galaxy is a bulge. More specifically, so you think of something kind of spherical when I say bulge, you should. But more specifically, um, the center of the galaxy actually is elongated in one direction. Um, and it's actually a rather straight feature, and that's why we call it a bar. Um, and uh, the bar is actually rotating steadily. It it's contains, uh, again, billions of stars that are on various orbits. These are not circular orbits. But as a whole, the density distribution is rotating. Uh, similarly, the spiral arms in mm -hmm. the disk of the galaxy um, uh, these, again, are not uh, solid features. They contain many, many stars. And the spiral arms are literally that. There are two spiral arm pattern, and the spiral arm pattern is rotating. Actually, I'm changing the, I'm doing the wrong sense of rotation. The bar and the spiral arms are rotating in the same way. But neither of them are the stars necessarily staying strictly in the same place in each object as it rotates, right? So the mm. stars in the disk are going around the galaxy, they can actually go in and out of the spiral arms. So the spiral arms are actually, you should think of them as a density structure, but for the stars, it's a density wave. I think we're going several layers deep here. No, no, this is good. So this it is, is good. A, it's a gravitationally induced density wave. So it's like a compression where things are just squeezing together because they're in gravity, and that wave itself, like the waves on the ocean, I guess, is just, yeah. is just circling around yeah. the the disk. The easiest way I f find to think about this is actually not um, so much waves on the ocean, but actually more like um, waves in a traffic flow, right. in a traffic pattern. Yeah. Uh, because if you're going speeding along a highway, if it gets uh, very congested, very dense, you often find that you speed up and it, apparently for no reason and the cars get further apart. And then you get to points where the uh, cars slow down and then the cars are much slow, closer together. So this is sort of what's happening to stars as they go around the galaxy. They go into a density wave uh, of the spiral arm, slow down slightly and become closer together. Mm. And then um, in between the spiral arms, they're moving at a more steady speed, a faster speed, and they get further apart. So we're, because we're in one of these spiral arms, so we're in a traffic jam, basically, uh, a cosmic traffic jam. We're right? on the edge of a spiral arm, yes. Okay, and is there any significance to that, that in terms of 
the fact um, we're in one rather than not inside one? Not for the sun. The sun is sort of five billion years old. But mm -hmm. actually, the spiral arms, because these are denser regions of the galaxy, and they're regions where um, all matter is compressed, um, that includes stars, but also gas and dust becomes compressed. These are regions where you expect to see star formation. So sometimes you find young stars are preferentially found in spiral arms. For, so for them, it could be significant. The spiral arm they're closest to could be their birthplace. But mm. the sun is sufficiently old that we don't think it's near its birthplace, if that makes sense. Right. Now, I asked on Twitter, I said, I'm speaking to Catherine Johnson, expert in Milky Way. Uh -huh. Uh, what questions do you have about the Milky uh -huh. Way? And on this on this theme of what is the anatomy of the Milky Way, yeah. one question people asked is, I've heard differing numbers about the number of stars in uh -huh. the Milky Way for decades. Uh -huh. Anything from 100 billion to 400 billion. What is, has that number mm -hmm. been refined over time and why, why is it that even our own galaxy we have such uncertainty? Uh, yeah, no, so, um, I think any of those numbers I would be happy with. So I think that um, you're talking, right, we're, we're astronomers, and the numbers we talk about are typically quite approximate, especially in terms of things like numbers of the stars in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. So I would say roughly 100 billion stars. Part of the uncertainty is because we, um, it's hard to see across our own galaxy, right? So other galaxies we can see from the outside, and we can get uh, a fair idea of all the stars that are in a galaxy. But in our own galaxy, we're right in the middle of it. So it's like saying, um, ah, you're in the middle of a crowd of people. You can count the number of people that are relatively close to you. But if that crowd goes on for a few hundred yards or meters in any direction, uh, you can't actually tell where the edge is. And right. you can't actually count all the people. And so that's what's happening with the Milky Way. It's hard for us to tell exactly But how it's many easier if you could see another crowd and you were in the top of a stadium or something, exactly. looking down at everyone, you could maybe have a better chance. Exactly, of, yeah. exactly. It's also exacerbated by the fact, let's pretend it's a cloud of people and um, it's kind of a misty day. So not only can't you see to the edge of the cloud, but they're actually obscured by mist. In the galaxy, uh, the edge of the galaxy, the stars at the edge of the galaxy, uh, along where most of the stars are in the disk, this disk component, there's also gas and dust. Mm. And that gets in the way and makes it hard to see to the other side. Right. So we've done the kind of the inside of the galaxy. We have the bulge, we have the thin disk, the thick disk, we have the spiral arms. You mentioned around the around the galaxy we have dark matter. Yeah. Um, what else is around our galaxy? There yeah. are, I think we tend to think that you just, there's nothing until you get to Andromeda, right? You just fly to the nearest major galaxy, Andromeda M31, and it's just, you know, vast oceans of empty yeah. space, but it's not empty. Yeah. There's stuff going yeah. on, and that's particularly of interest to your to your research. Exactly. So I'm glad you asked that question because I forgot to mention this part, <laughs> which is um, about 1% of the stars in our galaxy. So this is why I wasn't worrying about them in the 100 billion. About 1% of the stars aren't actually in the disk or the bulge. They're actually in a, a halo, um, which is the technical term. So the stellar halo of our galaxy mm -hmm. contains about 1% of the stars. And these are exploring um, are the regions of the galaxy that are really dominated by dark matter. Um, the other thing to realize, um, which is kind of fun when you start to think about it, is not only is our galaxy made of orbiting stars and orbiting dark matter, but objects in the universe are all orbiting around each other. So you work on planets, and we mm -hmm. know the planets orbit the sun. Um, but the next level thing that we need to think about uh, when you step to galaxies is the sun is orbiting our galaxy. It's orbiting all the other stars in the galaxy. Mm -hmm. And all the other stars are orbiting each other. Beyond that, when you start talking about other galaxies, the galaxies themselves are interacting. Gravity works on all scales. Um, so galaxies can orbit each other as well. So in the stellar halo of the Milky Way, we have stars orbiting each other, mm -hmm. but we also have dwarf galaxies that themselves are orbiting the Milky Way and are bound by the gravitational attraction of the Milky Way. And, and what defines a dwarf galaxy and how many of them around yeah. us are there? Yeah. Okay, so um, strictly the term galaxy um, is usually applied to something where we think that there's some motions of the stars within it that are not... Um, uh, cannot be explained by uh, the presence of stars alone. 
So galaxies are objects where we think there's significant amounts of dark matter in mm -hmm. them. So in other words, if you looked at our Milky Way and you looked close to our Milky Way, uh, so, and when I say close, I mean within, within about uh, 10 times the size of the disk of the Milky Way, you would actually find blobs, apparent blobs, uh, collections of stars concentrated uh, in this halo. And when you look closely at those collections of stars, um, you would notice that the stars are moving much faster than you would expect from the gravitational attraction of the stars alone. Mm -hmm. And that tells you there's some dark matter. And these are present as well. And these are satellites of the Milky Way, satellite dwarf galaxies. So this kind of obviously harkens back to Vera Rubin, mm -hmm. the discovery yeah. of galaxies yeah. that were the were themselves rotating too fast yes and that was one of the first piece of evidence yes. that we found for dark yes. matter and now we seem to have a much better understanding especially of the dark matter in our own milky way yes thanks to is it is it largely informed by the motions of these clusters then is that what's telling us about the structure well uh so the structure of dark matter halos um let's go back to vera rubin for a minute yeah and discuss that um, and um, remember I told you that stars are moving in nearly circular orbits in the disk. And what Rubin, Vera Rubin's um, groundbreaking work in the 1970s was to actually study the motions of uh, stars in the disks of galaxies. Other galaxies. Other yes. galaxies. Yeah. And realize that um, they're actually moving too fast. So the stars, the sun in our galaxy is moving at about 200 kilometers per second. Mm -hmm. So if we add up the gravitational attraction of 100 billion other stars in our galaxy, we can calculate that actually that should mean that the, star, the sun is not moving on a circular orbit. It should actually be uh, moving on a, either an elliptical orbit, mm -hmm. or ex sorry, I should say eccentric orbit, or it's escaping entirely from our galaxy. Mm. So the fact that it's moving so fast actually tells us not only are there 100 billion stars in our galaxy and some gas and some dust, but there must be something we can't see. And this was the first evidence for the presence of dark matter. So as I said, the disk of the Milky Way goes out a certain extent, but the stellar halo of the Milky Way containing these dwarf galaxies goes out to 10, actually um, maybe even 20 times that extent. And what we can tell from the motions of the dwarf galaxies alone, but um, we're about to get to other ideas too, mm -hmm. we can get some idea that those dwarf galaxies as a collection are also moving too fast for them to be bound just by the stars that we see in the Milky Way. I see. Yeah. yeah. So that it's indirect evidence, but it's still very powerful evidence for the yeah. existence of something pulling on yeah. these stars yeah. uh, more than they should be. Of yeah. course, a lot of people um, the layperson might be upset with the idea of dark matter because you can't hold it in your hands. You can't, yeah. you can't yeah. see it in the laboratory. Yeah. And in a way, it feels like a, a fiction that astronomers have created to explain yeah. the data. Yeah. But of course, we think it's much more than just a fiction at this point because we have so many pieces of evidence yeah. pointing at this. But maybe um, you could speak to that. What is the uh, case for a modified theory of gravity to explain yeah. the accelerated motions versus a dark yeah. matter distribution. Yeah, yeah. So um, let's go backwards for a minute and just talk about um, probes. Um, and then we can go forwards to your question. Because mm -hmm. I wanted to talk about uh, one more probe that's dear to my heart that I'm uh, sure you want to hear about, I David. Gonna, yeah, I know what you're going to say. You yeah. know <laughs> what I was going to say. Um, so. Um, one more concept I want to introduce at this point is um, what is going to happen to these dwarf galaxies as they orbit the Milky Way. Um, and these dwarf galaxies can actually get torn apart by the tidal field of the Milky Way. So if you think about how the moon raises tides on the Earth, you may have heard about this. Uh, so the Earth is a finite size object and the moon is uh, sitting about, uh, I think it's about 100 Earth radii away. Um, 60. Yeah. Okay, there we go. <laughs> yeah. I was suddenly unsure. <laughs> so order of magnitude thanks. from astronomy. You're exactly. Right. Yeah. <laughs> so 60 is nearly 100. Yeah. So we're this agreeing. So it's sitting 60 Earth radii away. Um, and the moon is exerting a gravitational pull on the Earth. Um, but one side of the Earth at any one time, given time is closer to the uh, moon than the other side of the Earth. Mm -hmm. 
So what this ha what happens here is, say, um, if we're thinking about uh, the Pacific and the Atlantic Ocean at two different times, then the Atlantic Ocean at some time might be closer to the moon than the Pacific Ocean. And what that means is the Atlantic Ocean is pulled slightly more towards the moon than the Pacific Ocean. And what that actually means is the, um, the oceans are bulging slightly mm -hmm. relative to the center of the Earth. And this is what causes the tides. The word tides comes from this effect mm -hmm. on the oceans. It makes the Earth's uh, oceans bulge slightly relative to the sli uh, center of the Earth as, they, uh, as the day goes by. And that bulge rotates as the Earth rotates. So, so the tides are really just a differential gravitational yeah. force. There's exactly. more force on one side than the other side of this exactly. object, whatever that object is. Exactly, yeah. exactly. So we experience this, and so this gives you a physical intuition. You experience this on the Earth, so you actually have experienced tidal forces in everyday life. Mm -hmm. Now you take that, this is a gravitational effect. The beauty of physics is, or the cosmological principle tells us, we take the physics we understand and we try and apply it everywhere in the universe. So if we apply this to dwarf galaxies, a dwarf galaxy orbiting the Milky Way, the closer part of the dwarf galaxy is pulled more directly, more strongly towards the Milky Way than the further part. And so you might get tidal bulges on dwarf galaxies. What's even more exciting is though, um, it can be more dramatic in this case. You can actually pull stars off from these tidal bulges and uh, have these stars, the uh, satellite, galaxy, this dwarf galaxy orbiting, orbiting the Milky mm -hmm. Way, can actually literally be pulled apart by the Milky Way. Like spaghettified in terms of the black hole analogy of tidal forces okay. in that extreme case, right? Yes, spaghettified. Yeah. Actually, I think that came from the dwarf galaxy community it did it. Okay. years ago. And black hole people stole it. They stole it, okay. yes, absolutely. <laughs> because um, there was a survey called the Spaghetti Survey back in the 1990s Interesting. Uh, for dwarf galaxies. And what the Spaghetti Survey was trying to do was find the remnants of dwarf galaxies in right. the 1990s um, that had been pulled apart. So not only do we see these dwarf galaxies orbiting, we're hoping to see dead dwarf galaxies, ones that have been pulled apart. And the spaghetti term comes from the fact that these stars don't just wander randomly off into space, they're also orbiting the Milky Way. So they start with a mean orbit of the dwarf galaxy. They're being pulled apart by the tidal field, but they're also uh, uh, just uh, slightly off from the main orbit of the dwarf galaxy. So what happens, they continue orbiting in the same direction. Isn't this a great visual? Um, and they end up creating long streams of stars. Yeah, and I, I apologize to the if people listening on the audio won't be able to see the visual, but you're waving your hands around in a very elegant way to to, to what looks like a stretching out of this, of this exactly. distribution. I guess exactly. an analogy with the black hole case would be, if you, if you were an astronaut falling into a black hole, your feet are closer to the black hole than your head, presumably if you're falling you know, feet first. And so your your feet are being pulled harder than your head and it's stretched, that's a stretching force then yeah. on your whole body. And yeah. these stars are feeling the same thing. Yes. It's a, it's a, it's a, it's a slower effect than, it's not as dramatic maybe as that as astronaut case, but it's an effect playing out over what, millions, billions of years on these clusters. Yes, we're talking about spaghetti in two different dimensions though. Uh -huh. So um, uh, what David's talking about is stretching in the radial direction. And, but actually, once that stretching is done, once the stars are unbound, in the Milky Way's case with a dwarf galaxy, the stars spread out along the orbit. Mm. And so you see spaghetti along the orbit. Okay, so this was a long aside because you were asking about Mond. Let's get to Mond, yeah. So how, how are these, uh, these are yeah. tidal streams. Yeah. How are these, the tidal streams, the, the shape of them, the dwarf yeah. galaxies, their motion, yeah. how is this yeah. helping us to distinguish between these two theories? Yeah. So. Um, the tidal streams um, as they orbit the Milky Way. Um, what you see for these streams, and we can see these around the Milky Way, we can see these around other galaxies. The discovery around the Milky Way has really been in the last 20 or 30 years. And actually at this point, just talking about numbers, we went going back to that. We have a, about um, 50, 60, 70, 
order of magnitude. Mm. Satellite galaxies that we have now discovered, uh, 30 years ago, we only knew of about 10. Mm. So these have been huge discoveries in the last uh, even uh, three or four years. And how many stars are typically in these dwarf galaxies? Um, they can range from having a billion stars to only containing a thousand stars. Wow. So a huge range, that's an order of uh, a million yeah. difference. Yeah. They're still only, they still only constitute a small percentage of stars in total in the Milky Way. Mm -hmm. But nevertheless, they're very interesting precisely because of what we're talking about, dark matter. So as these streams spread around the galaxy, because they're orbiting, the orbit is curved. Now, the curvature of that orbit itself is a signature of the gravitational potential, the gravitational force. If there was no gravitational force centered on the galaxy, uh, the stars would go off in straight lines, mm -hmm. and you would see a straight stream. But you don't, you see curved streams. So actually, they're a dramatic, just from the morphology alone, is a dramatic demonstration that there's something pulling on the uh, uh, on the streams. Now, whether that's dark, modified, uh, dark matter or some modified form of gravity, that's a different question, right? Uh, first of all, for um, dark matter, the presence that there's something that is unseen or modified gravity, you can get from just the fact you see the curvature alone. Um, perhaps most dramatically, there's one galaxy uh, outside the Milky Way. It's called NGC 5907. So I encourage all the listeners without mm -hmm. visuals to do a quick type into Google search and do NGC 5907 and look at images. Okay. And it will pull up an image of an edge-on galaxy and you'll see a beautiful example of a tidal stream encircling it. Now you should notice immediately something about this tidal stream. It has a sort of uh, rosette shape. It's not a complete rosette, but it has one loop and then it has another loop going off at about 120 degrees from the first loop. Mm. And actually the shape of that uh, loop alone betrays the fact, tells you that there's more to this galaxy than just the disk that you can see. Mm -hmm. Because if it was just the disk that we could see, this um, orbit should not have that shape. It should look much more elliptical, much more like mm. the orbits in the galaxy. So this because to me- of, Because of the 2D nature of the disk versus the 3D nature of some presumed halo, ah, is that the difference? No, 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 the difference here that I'm trying to appeal to first, we're going to get to that in a minute. The difference here I'm trying to appeal to first is um, the difference between the sorts of objects you study and the orbits, those orbits with the mm -hmm. sort of orbits I study. So in the solar system, you probably know, I know you know, David, mm -hmm. that orbits are elliptical or, uh, or actually nearly circular, but they're mm -hmm. what we would call closed orbits. They repeat the same shape over and over. Now, in and around, and this is because, sorry, let me finish that thought. This is because all the mass, the vast majority of the mass, is contained in this tiny point that we call the sun at the center of the solar system. Mm -hmm. And then there's virtually no mass beyond that. In the rest of our galaxy, we have the disk of stars, which is extended, uh, an extended mass distribution. The vast majority of the mass is spread out over a large distance. And then the halo spread, dark matter halo, spreads that mass out even further. And then the orbits in this case are not closed. They're actually what we call rosette. And if you think about uh, a spirograph that can draw a rosette pattern, if you don't know what a spirograph is, another Google search, but mm -hmm. look up a rosette pattern. It looks like a flower, an orbit of a satellite or of stars in the Milky Way. They look like petals, mm -hmm. which are gradually uh, processing around the plane of the galaxy to form um, a certain well, to form a pattern that looks like a petal pattern, a petal pattern. Okay, now so, we go back. So, yeah, so how yes. do these motions? How yeah. do these motions tie into this, this, this distinguishing between right. these two so theories? So if you have if you have a single mass, if all the mass in the galaxy was concentrated in a giant sun at the center, then the orbits would be closed. They would be a single petal, an mm -hmm. ellipse, and it wouldn't make a flower pattern. So the fact that you see a flower pattern is telling you not only you have an extended di extended disk, but when you see that flower pattern far out beyond the edges of galaxies, it's telling you that there's something there, could be a dark matter halo, that is causing the flower pattern. Otherwise, you would see an ellipse. I want, is this related to um, Newton's shell theorem? So I think there's a theorem in classical mechanics that says that if all of the mass is inside of your orbital path, you can 
more, mostly approximate it as just being like a single point, like all the mass mm -hmm. of the sun is it can be treated as being concentrated within a single point because all of the mass of the sun is interior to the Earth's orbit, mm -hmm. and so you can get away with that approximation. Mm -hmm. And when you talk about distributed mass, well, if there was uh, a binary star, even two suns, mm -hmm. you could still largely explain the Earth's mm -hmm. motion still pretty well with mm -hmm. just a circular elliptical orbit because you mm -hmm. could pretty much concentrate them to a single point. Now, here with the galaxy, you have many, many suns yeah. within inside your yeah. orbit. But then with the dark matter, you have stuff also outside of your orbit, yeah. this extended halo. So is it the fact it's outside or is it just the fact the mass has been distributed across so many places that's causing the petal-like patterns? Right. So the other part of, of Newton's theorems talks about the mass outside. And if that mass is spherically distributed, mm -hmm. it doesn't have an effect on the force that you're calculating inside. So really it's the second point is the important one. <clears throat> As you uh, move along an orbit that might not be exactly circular, then you're actually changing the mass that you, you're seeing mm. within your orbit. So that means that you, um, uh, you actually, uh, if you express the force as gm over r squared, then your m is changing as you move out through the galaxy as well as your r. I see. Whereas for the solar system, G M over R squared, the M doesn't change, right? But the R does change. Okay. Right. So it really is the distribution within it's, the orbit that's it's making the difference. The distribution. It's exactly the distribution. And so that therefore those petals are probing how not only the the matter of the stars is distributed, but also how the the invisible stuff, the dark matter, is distributed but only inside. So you don't really know what it's doing beyond the tidal stream. You just know what the distribution is inside the orbit. Is it, that true? Exactly. Okay. Exactly. And that's precisely, actually, this is, uh, I love this point that you're making, because that is actually why we want to find tidal streams. The disk of the galaxy probes the inner region of the galaxy to probe exactly how extended the dark matter halo is. We really need these tidal streams mm. and they're very powerful too. So if we can find tidal streams further and further out, they will tell us more and more about how the dark matter is distributed. Now, do you think we're ready to get back to Mond? Or yeah, let, let's let's talk about that. We've we've gone so many tangents here, but it's been fun to explore. Yeah. Um, you, why why are you convinced? Maybe you're not convinced, but why are so many astronomers convinced that dark matter is the explanation for all of this intricate behavior? Yeah, well, so I, th I think the answer comes from looking at many scales, actually. I think that the Milky Way, ultimately the tidal streams could help us um, with um, trying to distinguish. Mm -hmm. um, but um, so let's start with the Milky Way alone and think about um, the evidence that's there. Um, so with the Milky Way alone, for example, um, there is a modified theory of gravity, which talks about instead of uh, hypothesizing this extended dark matter halo, let's instead say that um, gravity as you get to large distances takes a very different form. Mm -hmm. And so basically it falls off faster than we would expect. Um, no, did I get that the right way around? Now I'm thinking, no, it's more, if, right. It falls off less fast than you would expect as you go to large distance. Oh uh, yeah. yeah, that makes sense. That makes yeah. sense, yeah. yeah. I said it backwards. So To explain the, ex the extra speed, you need more gravity out exactly, there. Exactly, yeah, okay. exactly. Um, but the idea is then that um, what you see, WYSIWYG, what you see is what you get, right? So the uh, all the uh, gravitational force, in this case, modified gravitational force, comes only from the other stars in the galaxy. So uh, one uh, way we should be able to distinguish in the Milky Way, whether that's true or not, is essentially uh, on large scales, the galaxy, the disk of our galaxy is very symmetric. Um, it's symmetric apart from the bar, which is only at the center. It's symmetric uh, azimuthally, and it's symmetric top to bottom. As a muthily, you mean kind of, uh, maybe just explain that, you mean kind of like rotating around like a clock face, like exactly. that angle? Yeah, exactly, okay. exactly. Mm -hmm. So there are spiral arms and there are bars, the bar, but in a global sense, it's it's pretty much symmetric as you go around a clock face, mm -hmm. exactly. So what that means is, according to this modified theory of gravity, as you go out further and further from the galaxy, you should find more and more that the force you're feeling is as immutely symmetric in angle, mm -hmm. and it's also symmetric top to bottom. So if we find evidence of, of distortions from of asymmetries, this, yeah. of asymmetries, 
uh, whether that's very large scale. It might be that there's a squash, which is, uh, let me see, it's, um, I'm gesticulating again. It's uh, in the plane perpendicular to the galactic disk. If we find a squash in a plane perpendicular to the galactic disk in the dark matter, mm -hmm. and that we, well, not dark matter, in the halo, if there's a squash in the force field perpendicular to the galactic disk that we need to assume in order to make those streams make sense, then that is a powerful uh, contradiction to a modified theory of gravity and a powerful point in favor of the idea that actually it's a matter distribution that we can't see that itself is squashed. So as a way of thinking about that, if, if you were in the plane of the, of the disk of the galaxy mm -hmm. and you were a certain distance away on the outer edges, say mm -hmm. uh, 200,000 light years or something, on mm -hmm. the outer edge of, this, of, the, of the Milky Way, mm -hmm. that you should feel the same gravitational potential as a point that's to the north pole almost of the galactic center and if there and you're looking for differences as you scan across from moving out of the plane to orthogonal to the plane yeah i that could be one way of looking at it but actually the disc would cause a difference because the disc is flat mm -hmm. so actually the the experiment i was suggesting was rather your um your uh let me see uh you're in the galactic plane in the equator, like the, equa um, the, equatorial, uh, the equator of the Earth, mm -hmm. and you actually look at 90, 90 degrees difference. So you'd look in, uh, I don't know, choose two points on Earth. So somewhere in South America versus somewhere in Africa. Right, right. And you would uh, ask yourself, uh, is there a difference in the force field in those two positions? Or almost like at 12 o'clock looking at three o'clock on the clock face. Good, I yeah. like that, okay. that's better, Yeah. that's better a large distance from the center, and you're looking at 90 degrees. Okay. That's, that's the experiment that I think that we really want to do. And I think it's becoming more and more feasible for the Milky Way at this point. So it's not, if you just took the Milky Way in isolation, you would not be able to distinguish between mond and dark matter, um, given, given current observational evidence. Um, I think it's on the edge because we're just getting to the point of being able to we really want to do this experiment um, by looking um, uh, at large distances from the desk. And we're just getting the tidal streams there and we're trying to understand distortions that we're seeing in those tidal streams because we are seeing distortions. So I think we're very close to be able to do that with this particular experiment. Mm -hmm. Now what I didn't say, there are other lines of evidence that make us really happy with dark matter, but that's more thinking about the cosmological scales where uh, the match on many, many scales works really well in this theory. Yeah. But I should be clear, um, I'm actually really happy that people, are con there is a subset of the community that keep on working on this and challenging us. Mm -hmm. It's a, um, at some point we should put it to rest entirely, but I think it's a good thing to always question. That's how science works, right? Yeah, yeah. It's, it's a sign of a healthy discourse when yeah. people are putting Four different yeah. theories and testing them as long as as long as we have testability which both yeah. these theories do then yeah. science is healthy in that sense yeah, yeah. um so we've we, we went out to the dark matter i guess the final thing i want to ask you about dark matter is what do we have a sense of the shape from you know assuming dark matter is the correct explanation um yeah. what is the implied shape is it just a i think you say it's like a halo which i think i normally think of just a big sphere just a big fluffy spherical cloud yeah. of dark matter that sits yeah. around us and it, it vastly engulfs us as well it's actually much larger of course than the milky yeah. way itself that the discs of the, the of the milky way yeah. but is it really a sphere or is it some other shape have we been able to measure the shape is it clumpy yeah. what do we know about it yeah so um a lot of what we know comes from theoretical modeling um, and therefore we don't know it it's hypotheses that we're testing so mm -hmm. the hypothesis that we're testing is that um, there is this dark matter halo and that every galaxy is surrounded by extended dark matter halo. Why are we testing that hypothesis? It's because of uh, large scale numerical simulations of how we think galaxies form in the universe. Mm -hmm. And in these simulations with our current understanding of gravity and matter, the easiest explanation is that these dark matter halo forms and zero thought of their spherical in shape. But more carefully in the simulations, they're actually triaxial, which actually means you take a sphere and you squash it in one dimension, and then you squash it in another dimension. 
So it might look something like an American football without the pointy bits at the end, right? Mm. And that's what we think dark matter halos on the largest scales would actually look like. Um, on top of that, so the other thing you mentioned, um, the universe, as we said, is formed of objects orbiting objects orbiting objects. And we've al already said that um, the Milky Way is, is, is orbited by um, uh, satellite galaxies. Mm -hmm. So each of those is a, has its own clump of dark matter. So you have to think about these halos of dark matter that are traxial, but within them are orbiting other galaxies with their own clumps of dark matter. Right. And the point where it gets really interesting is we actually think as you go down in scale for these dark matter halos, there may be some dark matter halos that contain no galaxies. And so that mm. means the 100 galaxies we see, we actually think are only the tip of the iceberg of the dark matter halos that are out there. They're the ones that contain light that we can see. But we actually think that there's 10 or maybe even hundreds times more dark matter halos around our Milky Way that um, are orbiting, but we simply can't see so these them. are clumps of dark matter yeah. that we would otherwise call a dwarf galaxy yeah. were it not for the fact they lack any or very few stars, maybe yes. a few stars, but n nothing that we would normally call a, a exactly. galaxy. Yeah, exactly. Wow. So unseen. So actually, that's um, uh, another direction that's really exciting um, for the tidal stream community mm. is not only mentioning the, measuring the global uh, distribution of dark matter, but also asking, can we find these missing rogue uh, mini dark matter halos. They're a very strong prediction of a certain type of dark matter and their presence or absence would tell us. For instance, if, um, if there's a modified theory of gravity, there should be no, um, uh, no mm. little lumps in the potential that we can't see. We should be able to see everything. So if we can find evidence of these little um, clumps of dark matter, it's a great distinguisher between different theories of gravity, also actually different theories of what dark matter is. So the way you do this, shall I, shall I just yeah, keep going? Yeah, my, my guess would be that you're basically looking in a simplistic way for stars orbiting nothing, ah. right? There's just, there's a star just going around an invisible yeah. crumb. like, well, there must be a clump yeah. there. But I'm, I'm sure it's more involved than that simple picture. Uh -huh. So that's an interesting idea. Um, I think our expectation is actually, it's very hard for stars to form in the very small dark matter halos. Because the idea is early on in the universe, they actually lose all their gas, which means they lose their ability to make stars. Mm -hmm. So we really think these are sort of like naked, naked dark matter halos. Mm -hmm. They have no clothes, as it were. Mm -hmm. So um, that's a great hypothesis, but it, it's not one we expect would work. Okay. So we go back to the streams, of course, we go back to the streams. And the idea is, imagine you are a set of, there's a set of stars orbiting, and they're orbiting in this beautiful stream, they're following each other along. If the dark matter halo is lovely and smooth, then you'll have a lovely smooth stream. But if it has all these little lumps in, the dark matter halo is, um, the stream is actually be being bombarded gravitationally as it orbits around the Milky Way. And it can actually break up the stream. It can cause gaps, it can cause bifurcations, etc. And the really exciting results uh, uh, fairly recently is we're starting to see these gaps and these bifurcations in the Milky Way. You need really good data to see this. Mm -hmm. It's very hard to see in other galaxies yet, so far. Um, but we're hoping that this is going to eventually give constraints on this, on uh, how lumpy our Milky Way is. So far, the indication is that it's about as lumpy as you would expect if the dark matter is a certain type of dark matter. Um, uh, I'm not sure if it's ruled out uh, modified gravity theories yet but it is pointing towards the existence of these halos that we don't actually see, which is really fun. So let me just ask you a bit more about on this because it's so interesting. Um, and I think a concept that many people will be fascinated by the idea of dark galaxies almost, yes. you might call them dark dwarf galaxies. Um, it almost helps with this chicken and egg problem of you know what came first, the, the, the stars, the galaxy, the, the disk of, gal of, of stars that form a Milky Way mm -hmm. galaxy, or was it the dark matter halo that comes first? Yeah. And if you have these naked dark matter dwarf galaxies, yeah. that implies that they are indeed the seeds and it's the stars get drawn into them and that, that's the, the beginning of galaxy yeah. formation to some degree. Do you agree with that? Oh, uh, um, I think it's a cartoon that's getting the elements right. So I would just um, rephrase it 
slightly. Um, mm-hmm. uh, so, it, you know, as humans, and I completely agree, this this is the right way um, to describe it in a cartoon level with some caveats. So as humans, we always want to put things in a sweet sequence. Yeah. And in the universe, it never happens. We want to know the order, yeah. Exactly. So I like to think of it more like the dark matter is a stage. It's a gravitational and dynamical stage against which there's the backdrop of how atoms like that compose you and me mm-hmm. and make stars, um, uh, how their evolution plays out. But they're constantly interacting through gravity. And that's why you can't say, it, that's why it's, it's a bit of a chicken and egg They're problem. not decoupled. They're yeah. not decoupled. Yes, yeah. So they it's speak not, to each other. Yes, exactly. So early on in the universe, um, uh, okay, let me go backwards. Uh, 80 to 90% of the matter in the universe is this dark matter. So that means that the gravity is dominated by the dark matter. This is why it's setting the stage. On the other hand, it doesn't build the stage and then the baryons arrive, the gas and you and me. Mm -hmm. What's actually happening is um, uh, the gas and the dark matter is constantly interacting. It's around from the start. So as the stage is being built, as gravity is taking a smooth distribution and making these dark matter halos, the gas is already falling into them. Right, so it yeah. is your picture, yeah. but it's coupled together and happening at the same time. And actually, even though they're only ten percent, twenty percent of the matter, these baryons can have a role in shaping the details of what happens in making those dark matter halos. And just to inject one of the complication to this story, black holes. Yeah. In terms of this chicken egg problem, that's another part of the story yes. of galaxy formation. Yes. We have a supermassive black hole in the center of our galaxy. It's thought that most major galaxies, Scimitorian, also have supermassive yeah. black holes in their center. And yeah. there has been some discussion about whether that's formed early and then the, you know, the rest of the galaxy yeah. forms around it or whether that's a product of the, the stars themselves. Yeah. And if you, you know, you mentioned this idea of looking for clumps, which is, it's, we're not really seeing the dark matter as a clump. You're just seeing a gravitational potential that yeah. implies something, something massive is there. Yes. So why could that that something not be a a, a, a black hole, maybe not a supermassive black hole, but yeah. a, a large intermediate sized black hole yeah. that is a potential seed that failed yeah. to form a galaxy yeah. around it? Yeah, so uh, great question. So um, uh, the analogy is really there completely. That's how we detect black holes too. We can also detect them dynamically. Mm-hmm. Um, I want to um, again do a bit of an aside just for the audience because I think this is very important. The supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy is 10 to the six solar masses, 10 to the a million times the mass of the sun. So that is um, supermassive, mm-hmm. but it's tiny compared to the mass of the galaxy. Mm-hmm. So all of the dynamics that I'm talking about um, uh, the, the supermassive black hole at the center of the galaxy, um, when we're at the distances I'm talking about, it just doesn't matter. It's not important. Okay. So just to put that aside. On the other hand, your other question is, um, it is indeed uh, lumps of about 10 to the 6, 10 to the 7 solar masses, a million to 10 million times the mass of the sun that we think are floating around unseen in our, uh, in our, around our own galaxy. The hypothesis you're talking about was actually tested way back in the 80s or 90s. Hmm. Um, there was a very famous paper by Toth and Ostreicher, and they actually tried to ask, well, maybe the dark matter is supermassive black holes, 10 to the 6 solar masses or so. Mm-hmm. And what they found is when they did this calculation, um, what would actually happen is the disk of our galaxy, because the entire dark matter halo was these 10 to the 6 solar massive black holes, would be bombarded constantly by these uh, points. Mm. And the points would actually superheat the galactic disk. When I say superheat, let's go backwards. I talked about the lumps in the dark matter halo um, changing the trajectory of the stars. Yeah. So if dark matter was 10 to the 6 solar mass black holes, it would change the trajectory of the stars sufficiently that our disk could not be a beautiful thin disk. It would actually be heated. So that's one point of evidence that dark matter can't be entirely supermassive black holes. And then once it's a different sort of dark matter, it's much more natural that it forms objects that are extended mass distributions mm. and not um, not subhalos that are individual black holes. To make a black hole, you have to pack matter into a very small space. And we already know, even observationally, dark matter doesn't like being packed small. It's much more extended mm. than the light matter in our galaxy. So you're, you're touching on something I want to ask you about here um, that is a big 
a big topic to get into, but the idea of and this, you mentioned a black hole, but let's just take a dwarf galaxy since yeah. we know they they exist around us, of them colliding, plunging through the disk yeah. of our Milky Way, yeah. which must happen if there's yeah. seventy of them and they're orbiting around sort yeah. of chaotically. That must sometimes happen. They plunge through, and you would think that would leave some imprint on yeah. the gravitational potential, like a relic, into yeah. the the way stars are distributed, and. We've, of course, just had this recent mission called Gaia, which has been yeah. revolutionizing our understanding of the motion of stars. So this is a, this is a multi-part question. So maybe we'll start with um, Gaia. Maybe you can tell us a little bit about what Gaia's been doing over the last few years, this space mission from the European Space Agency, yeah. and how that's helping us to understand the history, as an example of like these mm -hmm. plunging events, the history of our own Milky Way. Yeah, so... Big okay. question. Do we, have, an, do we have another? Gaia. How many hours do we have? <laughs> we can keep going for you. Yeah, it's fine. Okay. We just want to hear. We're, we're just curious and we want to hear about the history of Milky Way here. Okay. So um, Gaia has been a tremendous step forward. And first of all, just um, let's talk a little bit about how science works. And I, I just want to be clear here. Gaia is a, a mission from the European Space Agency that they've been putting together throughout my career. Mm -hmm. And I'm not young, so <laughs> I'm not that old. But um, Decades, they've been putting this together. They launched uh, Gaia in 2013, and uh, we got the first uh, data release from Gaia in 2018, five years later. Uh, so this is um, billions and billions of dollars, and thousands of astronomers in Europe have been working on this. And the data release immediately came to the entire scientific community on Earth. Actually, the entire community, anybody on this call. Democratic science. Yeah. Yes, exactly. And this is uh, the ideal of science and indeed how a lot of science works. Mm -hmm. So it's a, a fantastic gift to the human race. Um, but I haven't told you what the gift is yet. So Yeah, what's it doing? The gift sounds really boring. It's an ancient, ancient branch of astronomy called astrometry. And that's measuring positions, metry, sort of measuring scales, measuring positions mm -hmm. on the sky. The most ancient branch of astronomy. You look up and are forming the constellations and saying, I see a pattern, that's astrometry. Mm -hmm. What uh, the Gaia mission did is measure the positions of uh, two billion stars in the Milky Way with extreme accuracy and monitor them over time. And that actually gives you two bits of information um, that have been uh, elusive. Um, one is um, uh, the distance to these stars. Mm -hmm. And that sounds trivial, right? You, um, until you think about it. You look up at a star in the sky, how do you know what distance it is? This is actually one of the hardest problems in astronomy and the most fundamental problems of astro in astronomy. Mm. Before Gaia, we knew distances very well to about 100,000 stars. And after Gaia, we know them to 2 billion stars. Mm -hmm. So what this means is we have a map for the very first time. We have a three-dimensional map of a significant portion of the Milky Way. So that's one thing. The second thing is if you measure the position of a, um, something uh, on the sky over time, you can actually see it move, mm -hmm. um, or many of them you can see them move, if they are actually moving. This is as simple as saying you watch a, a train on the horizon go by, you know it's moving because you see it move relative to the bushes in front of it, for example. That's exactly what Gaia has done. So it measures the motions of things perpendicular. For two billion stars. For two billion stars. So for the first time, we've got this gorgeous map of um, the disk of our galaxy at an unprecedented level. Um, but it also extends to the stellar halo that we've been talking about. So, so would, these aren't just the nearest two billion. This, because we said earlier, there's 100 billion stars in the yeah. Milky Way. Yeah. How extended is the Gaia survey looking? Right. So actually, let's step back. We, uh, you mentioned one number during this podcast, 200,000 light years. Mm -hmm. So that's uh, about the extent, that's about the 10 times the radius of our galactic disk mm -hmm. is 200,000 light years. The uh, entire uh, dark matter halo actually extends to more like 600,000 light years or even more. And the um, uh, the uh, width of the disk is uh, 20, 30,000 light years or so. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, uh, in terms of those scales, we think that uh, Gaia should be able to see to about 30,000 light years. So what that means in effect is it can see just over halfway across our galactic disk and make a beautiful map of the galaxy in 3D, okay? 
Um, but not all of those, because that, that would be more than two billion exactly, stars. Exactly, yeah. exactly, exactly. The very brightest stars, it can see further and it can measure their motions, but mm -hmm. it has a hard time seeing distances. Right, so like the little red dwarfs, it, yeah. it misses those once you get far out. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there are two key things. Um, I mean, there are many, many, many things that this has taught us. Um, let's say three key things I, I'd like to mention that this has taught us. One is that um, uh, Gaia has definitively shown um, the evidence of a bifurcation, um, a very strong bifurcation and very visible bifurcation in one of those tidal streams that we were talking about. And the best exp explanation for that bifurcation is a collision with an unseen dark matter halo. Hmm. So that's very exciting. So can you, what do you mean by bifurcation here? Just explain a bit more. It means a stream paralleling another stream. So okay. basically you see one stream and it looks as if it splits apart into two streams. I see. So yeah. it's almost as if this Like a river splitting into two. Exactly. Okay. It's almost as if this dark matter halo plunged through the stream and split it apart. Hmm. So it's not it's it's the backwards of the river splitting into two because it's splitting downstream. I see. If you see what yeah, I'm saying. Yeah. Um so that's one. That's been a remarkable result. And that was actually made by uh, a Columbia. Uh, Ex-Columbia graduate student, Adrian Price Whelan. <laughs> Wonderful. Uh, sorry, I had to do that plug. <laughs> Second thing. We'll get him um, on here at some point, I'm sure. Exactly. Yeah. Second thing um, I'm really excited about, but actually I was not involved with this uh, research. There were three groups um, worldwide, more, but three key groups um, who have been pursuing looking at the history of the Milky Way. And the way they've been doing this is looking at dead dwarfs around the galaxy, meaning these are not just streams. Over time, these streams can get pulled apart enough that you can't see them as individual streams. They get mixed together. Mm -hmm. And what these groups do, have done have looked towards the central parts of our, star, uh, of our stellar halo, the ones that are almost overlapping with the disk of our galaxy. And they've teased apart from that disk of that galaxy, or not the disk, the stellar halo of the galaxy, that it se seems to be composed of a finite number of clumps. And each of those clumps, they're associated with um, dwarf galaxies that we can't even see now. Mm. So what this is saying is we're performing galactic archaeology, is the catchphrase. Yeah. We're digging into the past of our galaxy and understanding events that we haven't even seen before. It's amazing. And th this is really exciting because actually this is something that I've spent three decades working on. And many people in those groups have spent three decades working on. And we hypothesized that we'd be able to do this. And they're actually doing this now and saying, how was our galaxy built? And how far back are these events in time? So far, the events are going about um, 8 billion years ago or so. So mm. it's about it's more than halfway back to the beginning of the universe. I can't say we're seeing the very beginning history, but we're seeing more than halfway back to the beginning of the universe. And it's it's um, been um, a dream to do that. It's partly what the Gaia satellite was built for. It was motivated by the early studies. So this is a very exciting time in the field. That was two. Yeah, and you had a third. The third one is actually what I've changed my own focus to. The third one is, you look at the disk of the Milky Way. Gravity is mutual, right? We spend our time, I give the example of a satellite galaxy being torn apart by the Milky Way. But if you think about the Earth, the example of tides I gave for the Earth was the opposite. The satellite was causing tides on the Earth. Mm -hmm. So actually the satellite galaxy can has a tidal influence on the Milky Way itself. So these satellites that we see now, and indeed the satellites that fell in the past and no longer exist, they will have all disturbed the disk of the Milky Way. And now that we look very carefully at the disk, not only do we see a disk composed of circular orbits, near circular orbits that are gently bobbing up and down, the entire disk is waving up and down. There are ripples we see in the disk. We saw hints of this before Gaia, but Gaia has provided a map where we can actually see the mid-plane of the disk going up and down across the half of the disk mm. that we actually look at. So it's like dropping a stone in a pond and the ripples slowly propagating through the disk of the Milky Way. I think that's a perfect analogy, nearly perfect analogy, yeah. because of course it's all gravitational. Yeah. But that's nearly perfect an analogy. And the reason this is exciting but also challenging is um, all, the, all the classical uh, models of the Milky Way that have been built of the disk, the dark matter halo, and the bulge in order to understand the global dark matter distribution, et cetera. These have been equilibrium models, models where the Milky Way is unchanging, has been around forever, it will be around forever. These ripples are telling us the Milky Way is not in equilibrium. 
Mm. It's rippling. It's like saying we want to model uh, our understanding of the ocean with the idea that on average it's flat. And that's what we've done for the Milky Way. And we understand this uh, or a pond, a perfectly flat pond. And we've assumed it's a perfectly flat pond. But actually, there are these ripples in it, which means we can't quite model the full nature of the pond without understanding the ripples. Mm. And that's the direction my research is going now. Is, is actually, I'm, for my entire career, almost up to this point, has been understanding small galaxies, satellite galaxies, how they're torn apart from the Milky Way, and what the Milky Way does to those galaxies. And now I'm concentrating on what, how does the Milky Way react to those galaxies, and what can that tell us? Yeah. So I'm going from trying to understand how the streams and dead dwarfs can tell us about history and dark matter distribution, to how the ripples in the pond can tell us about the things that are causing the ripples. So the, I guess we've also have gained here a, a appreciation of just what a dynamic environment the Milky Way is. Yes. It's not a, yes. a static, yes. homogenous yes. disk as we might portray yes. in, a, in a picture or something. Yes. And within this maelstrom and chaos of all of this motion, yes. um, it makes me wonder about the motion of our own sun in that context. Um, we said the sun is kind of on the fairly near the outskirts of the galaxy. Yeah. It's about uh, eight kiloparsecs away from the center. Yeah. And it must have been born, presumably, in a cluster of yeah. many siblings, yes. of many other stars that yes. would have been born from the same cloud, the same joint molecular cloud, we'd call it, as us. Yes. And I wonder, with all of this motion and how dynamic we appreciate the Milky Way is, would those siblings have been scattered now across over the five billion years since, or would we expect them to still be near us? Yeah, no, that's a great that's a great question, and uh, you're spot on. The sun is is um, we don't think is anywhere near its siblings. Um, uh, another fun part of galactic archaeology is to try and dig into those disk stars mm -hmm. and try and understand that question, understand the process. Uh, I can't. I can't resist mentioning two colleagues. So there's a graduate student here, Lucy Liu, mm. who's precisely, precisely, she's working with Mel Melissa Ness, and they are trying to understand if we can tell where stars have come from, from their present positions. Um, and one way to do that is by uh, looking at the chemical abundances. So that's, um, that's a really fun chemistry problem. So like the chemical thing, if the chemical fingerprints identical or very similar to our own, mm -hmm. you can tag that as being a sibling. Yeah, yeah, exactly. That's that's a whole. I want to ask. Mm, I want to go a slightly different direction mm -hmm. um, because um, that's opening a whole other yes, direction. Yeah. <laughs> um, and I just wanted to stay on dynamics for a minute longer. Right. So one of the things in terms of understanding these ripples is to understand what stars tend to stay together in the Milky Way. And so actually, um, what my group has been doing in the last few years is um, to uh, try and understand how to take the dynamical information that um, uh, Gaia has given us. So to, to, to give you a sense here, Gaia gives us a sense of distances and motion. Once you have distances and motion, you can start thinking about orbits. It doesn't tell you orbits directly, but you can start thinking about orbits and how to group stars in orbits. Mm -hmm. um, and one of the beauty of uh, stellar streams is that they tell you something about orbits. They tell you they're on similar orbits. Mm. In the disk, you have to find other ways of doing it. So you get the information from Gaia, and it allows you to group stars in orbits. If you put stars in groups of similar orbits, meaning similar amounts of time they take to go around the galaxy, then you can actually uh, put stars into groups that have a similar history. Mm. And this allows you to look in more detail at the uh, structures that we see in position and velocity in these group spaces. And it, it does tie into what Lucy and Melissa are doing yeah. because it ties into uh, dynamic groups and whether those dynamic groups coincide with chemical groups. And together that can make a very powerful way of dig digging into a history that has been really mixed up in the galactic disk in a way that it's not mixed up in the stellar halo. It's a much more challenging problem. It's it's a, a, the type of problem in astronomy I love where, and why I love the field of yeah. astronomy so much, yeah. that it's like being a detective at the crime scene. Yeah. That you can't, yeah. you can't 
change anything really you can't yeah. reproduce the experiment and like a physicist who or a biologist who can just go in the lab and do more yeah. experiments we have what we have and we have to think so deeply and carefully yeah. about the patterns and every yeah. clue that is left in that room and yeah this problem really epitomizes that yeah no i absolutely agree i love the way you put that that's exactly how i think about it as well so on this human on the human aspect of this I have to ask you, you know, because Gaia releases its data in these big dumps, yes. <laughs> right? And yes. everyone across the world gets it at the same time, yes. which is great, but probably also as someone active in, in this area, a little yeah. bit stressful because yeah. you'll have competition with other groups, yes. other scientists. Um, maybe just tell us, what was that like? You've, I think we've gone through three of these now. Yes. Talk about maybe one of them. What were you doing when the data release happened and, oh. and what was that whole experience like? Well, first of all, every day feels like, every one of those days feels like a massive celebration and, it, and you get a wonderful sense of community across the world. Mm -hmm. um, so the very first data release, um, uh, there were six of us sitting in a room together. And let's see, it was David Spurgel, Keith Hawkins, Adrian Price Whelan, myself, and um, Sarah Pearson. And I'm forgetting, it was at least those five. Mm -hmm. um, and um, we waited for the release to come down. It was 6 a.m. in the morning. We'd all got up. Because <laughs> it's European time, I guess. Yes, yeah. yes. And the release came down, and uh, then people um, started frantically making plots for fun. And Keith um, was the first one to get there and sharing a plot of what the data looks like. And it was just a tremendous feeling, and not because of the competition, actually. There was an immense sense of unity. Mm. People were posting the plots they were making from all over the world. Mm. So we were getting posts from Joe Bovey in Canada. We were looking at the post from the Europeans as well. On Twitter or something? Where were these? Appearing? Exactly, yeah, exactly. Okay. And you know how bad I am with Twitter. So <laughs> yeah. I was getting everybody else to show them to me. So that it was wonderful sense of community. And we also got a message later from the PI of Gaia, uh, Andrew Brown. And he wrote and he said, which felt really good, he could see when the US woke up because he could see us downloading the data. Hmm. And that he felt um, it gave him a really great sense of pride and community because he knew that the data was being downloaded by scientists around the world. And he, he felt that sense of connection to us, mm. uh, even though he wasn't there. And he felt what a gift he'd given us that we were up at 6 a.m. Yeah. and downloading the yeah. data. So that was a wonderful story. Um, on the set, uh, For myself, it's interesting. Um, for myself, I found that I haven't been on the discovery papers. And I think that speaks to the nature of the sort of science that I do. Um, so the groups um, who do this uh, are typically uh, magnificent data miners. They're great at making discoveries, finding clues in the data itself. I work somewhat differently. I think about the physics and think about what you could find. And that's what I've been doing for two or three decades. And I find that that's what I'm doing again. I find it, I wish I was more on the discovery side, but I'm not pulled that way. Mm. I'm excited to see the discoveries uh, come out. I'm thrilled when my colleagues um, Amina Helmi, Vasily Belokarov, Charlie Conray, these are, um, and Joe Bovey, mm. uh, Adrian Price Whalen, again, mm -hmm. Sarah Pearson, these are uh, big figures in the field. When they publish papers with discoverers in them, uh, I can't help mention Teresa Antoja, one of Amina Helmi's students, she published a groundbreaking um, uh, paper on the uh, second data release. Uh, Wilma Trick, another second data release paper that I love. But what I find myself pulled to is not to enter that craziness because I hate feeling that sense of competition actually. Mm -hmm. um, and I'd much rather celebrate. Um, so you, I, it's a young person's game, that, that racing well, around yes, chasing. <laughs> yes and no, yes and no. I, yeah. I hate the sense of competition and I much prefer the sense of excitement, the sense of contribution. So I find myself moving into not uh, what people are doing with Gaia now, but what can we do with this data that's unexploited? Like, I don't want to do the things that we said we could do. I want to think about the things we didn't know we could do. Mm. And actually, Teresa and Toha's paper inspired exactly that. That's another whole hour to explain. But mm. that inspired the thinking I'm doing now, thinking about the disequilibrium Milky Way and what we can do. The tools aren't there to understand that data set, and that's what my group is working on. And it's been uh, five years since the first data release. Uh, three years since the second data release. No, I'm getting this the wrong way around. But uh, I'm not getting the dates right. We've, we have now, I think, three data releases, the right? The third data We've release had that. was so 2022. We, so maybe this is a good uh, question to sort of close us out on, is the future. Um, what's what's more to come from Gaia? Yeah. And 
even beyond Gaia, yeah. what what uh, new observations are you looking forward yeah. to to yeah. changing the field? Yeah. So I think that the um, uh, answer to your first question, the um, which relates to what's more to come from Gaia. So the second data release was a key one from Gaia. I think that was 2018. The third one, first one was 2016. Third one was 2022. Mm -hmm. I am on a discovery paper in 2022, <laughs> inspired by Teresa and Toha's work. And exactly, we took um, the Gaia data at that point was more accurate and more accurate for a larger sample of stars. So we were able to do what Teresa and Toho did, which was look very carefully at the motions of stars near the sun. And what we did was exactly this trick I was telling you about, where we split those stars into groups to understand the dynamical signatures in different groups. Teresa and Toho had found a, a beautiful spiral pattern in a, a subset of 7 million stars. We took the new subset of, of 35 million stars and find different spirals in each of those subsets. So we'll do another conversation where we discuss what that means. Mm -hmm. But the point is, by thinking about the data really carefully and thinking about the dynamics carefully, we were able to extrapolate from that much more detailed information than we would have been without thinking about the dynamics. Looking ahead, the richness of the data set, every year that goes by, a Gaia becomes more accurate because it can measure the positions more uh, carefully and for a larger sample of stars. And so that means that the jump from 2018 to 2022 is only get, going to get better and better for mm -hmm. Gaia. Yeah. And just a teaser, looking forward, the thing I think I'm most excited about in 10 years' time, I think I'm going to spend those 10 years working on the Gaia. But in about 10 years' time, there is um, uh, the U.S. is building a data set that it's going to give to the world too from the Legacy Survey of Space and Time which is being performed by Rubin Observatory. Mm -hmm. I encourage everybody to go and look at this. This will be the US government and the US people's gift to the world, the, similar to the European Space Agency. A gift back. Making, A gift making, back, yeah, which, exactly. Yeah. Um, which is um, uh, uh, a movie of the sky. Every three days, we're going to take a complete picture of the sky to much deeper depth than Gaia was able to go. We won't be able to do exactly the same things of Gaia. But for the Milky Way science, we'll be able to reach to the far outer regions of our galaxy and beyond and look for stars in those regions and beyond that we haven't seen before. Mm. And I'm tremendously excited to discover exactly what's out there. And it will start answering the full extent of our dark matter halo. What does it look like in the very outreach? How does our dark matter halo connect to Andromeda? And are there stars out there between us and Andromeda going off into intergalactic space? It seems that the more we discover, the more it changes that naive picture that yeah. we all grew up with and the more complicated yeah. our entire environment seems to be. Has that, just as a final thought, has that, does your study of the Milky Way and its environment affect your own outlook on this this thing called life, this, this journey that you're on as a human and our place and all? I think, I, I'm glad you said that because I think um, it's important to take time to think about that and mm. when I do take time uh, it is um, humbling in a way but it's also wonderful to it's a great career to have to be contributing to that inspiration yeah especially when you talk to people who don't get to think about this every day yeah it's, right? a, it's a pleasure that we get paid to, to think about yes. astronomy in space and our place in the universe and hopefully enrich other people's experiences of the universe as well. So right. Catherine, thank you so much. This is a great pleasure. I know we only got through a fraction of the things that you work yeah. on, so I'm sure we'll have to talk again yeah. in the future. So thank you so much for coming on. Thanks for asking, David. This <laughs> has been terrific. So that was my conversation with Katherine Johnson. I hope you enjoyed it. For me, one of the things I really took away whenever I really talked to Catherine, but especially from the interaction, was just how much we still don't know about our home galaxy and especially its origins and how it came to be, but also how it kind of shatters our view of the galaxy as a static, unchanging place. And in fact, it is a very dynamic, constantly evolving place that will surely look very different to the future as much as it has done in the past and how our knowledge of the behavior of stars is shaping and informing this 
changing view of our own home galaxy. So I hope you enjoyed that as much as I did. If you are enjoying these podcasts, then of course, please do make sure that you are subscribing on whatever platform you're listening to this on. And also, if you really want to help us out, you can become a donor to my research team, the Cool Worlds Lab, by heading to www.coolworldslab.com slash support. That's www.coolworldslab.com slash support. So thank you so much for listening, everybody. And until next time, stay thoughtful and stay curious.